Hey, good morning. So, uh, let's talk about Lock and Low Publishing, World of War, and probably the best way for me to couch what I want to talk about with you is the, uh, the experience I had with the old version, the, old, the prior owners, you know, Mark Walker's Lock and Low system, and sorry about the blurriness, but it's the front-facing camera. I want to show you a few things and then tell you about what I did yesterday for four and a half, five hours with the new World at War system, which was uh, interesting. So let's let's have a quick chat and, and understand what my context is. And if you have followed, uh, and hi, Kevin, welcome to the big board, etc. cetera. Um, if uh, you've uh, looked at or seen any I'm trying to sit still, but the camera's going to adjust like this. I guess it is what it is. Uh, if you've looked at or seen any of my videos uh, on World of War, you've noticed that I've done a lot of kind of thematic slash narrative style things, a lot of stop motion stuff, because that game really grabbed me as a, wow, I'm moving M1s around and shuffling uh, battalions of, T-72s and fire and laws and saggers and baggers and you name it, we were doing it and choppers and all sorts of fun things, right? So highly evocative gameplay for the, um, for the, for the system. And so I, you know, when I was really first getting into the game, I got caught up in the story, right? And I'm one of the few people who probably actually didn't mind the zombies and the werewolves and things like that because it was, you know, it went a little, but uh, at the end of the day, the the rationale behind World War Three starting, I was okay with. So let's just say that. <clears throat> so this is the reprint deluxe edition of the original um, uh, Eisenbach Gap, which is the very first module, and I received the original one and one other module, I think uh, The Untold Stories, as a, a Secret Santa gift, and I kept it in shrink for ever and a day. I didn't open it and didn't know what it was, and this is back probably 2011, maybe even 2010, just as I was getting back into wargaming, and I was all excited about getting some free shit, right? All right, we had an interruption there, sorry about that. I think I got to the point where I was saying I got some free stuff. And, Anyway, so I kept hold of this game and didn't play it. And then finally I was asking online, like, hey, you know, what's this game about? Is it any good? Should I crack the shrink? Because, you know, it'll ruin the value of it and all this sort of stupid stuff, right? So it's a totally newbie thing to do, right? Um, some guy said to me, I, uh, who I ended up becoming sort of, sort of friends with, uh, about, said, hey, why don't you shut the up and play the game and see if you like it. If you don't like it, get rid of it. Well, I played four or five games. I was like, oh, that's really cool. Man, that was really cool. And then I found a guy in town and we started playing. Fast forward, I've probably got 100 plus games under my belt of different scenarios and multiple plays of some scenarios. And one scenario in particular that I used to teach people how to play the game when I was introducing new people to the system was the very first scenario in the, in the module which I now forget the name. I think it's first moves. Uh, you know, this module came with like 12, uh, yeah, first moves. Came with 12 or 12 scenarios and they put a couple extra ones in the, in the reboot, not the reboot, in the, in, the, in the deluxe edition. And what, so let's talk about, so this game really captured my attention, right? So, uh, and I would use this first move scenario and the reason why I'm mentioning that is because uh, it's the first scenario I played with the new system is first moves, just to see what the, what the difference was and how it all kind of worked out. And uh, the, there's a lot of, there's a kind of a love-hate relationship with the world at war. Uh, I really don't know if the lighting here is really annoying. If it's annoying me, so it must be annoying you. Uh, the uh, the game had has that kind of love hate relationship with fans. People like it, but that they, they want either more detail or they want it to be something it's not, or they didn't like the fonts on the counters and the counter art was too small and the, the counters were too small and why couldn't it be just like Nations at War and 
what you know how does this work and how why does that work this way and that's not how airplanes work and that unit was overpowered and you know there's a rules reference that doesn't re refer to a paragraph the paragraph's not there uh there's you know different rules spread across the system as the system evolved and it became very difficult to keep track of everything and rationalize everything and in some cases you might even have had different the same uh, type of unit, a Leopard 2 or an M1 or uh, whatever the case may be, 62s, 64s, T72s, T80s, the Black Eagle, T90, and all these other things. And they all had different ratings sometimes in different modules. So it, it, it became a freaking hairball, right? So you had to really love it to play it. And you had to kind of let go in the classic, you know, because one, one of the things that Mark Walker liked to do was just... Let it go. Just play the game. Have fun. And don't worry about the details, right? The, the granular details, because it's not ASL. And all on board with that. Loved it. Like I said, 100 plus plays probably. I could probably look up how many plays. Maybe I'll make a note in the, in the comments about that. I think if I stop moving my head, maybe that will help with the shadow and focus changing. <coughs> anyway, we played this game. Loved it. Enjoyed it a lot. And uh, in the first move scenario, let me just check one other thing. In the first move scenario, there is uh, it's T-72s versus M1s. It's Team Yankee, right? And the, the T-72s come on with uh, four fire missions and one smoke mission. And uh, they, they, they put up a decent fight. Now, one of, the, one of the frustrating things, of course, here is uh, that... I don't believe there's any OB in this, so you just got to rummage around in the counters and find Team Yankee. But Team Yankee is basically, let's call it two M1, M1A1 counters, uh, platoons, uh, a, a platoon of dudes, uh, a uh, ATGM unit, and one other piece of crap that I can't remember, and then 113. And so you would end up in this... Uh, uh, funky scenario where you would let's see if I can find the board for you real quick and we'll show you what I mean where you would have uh, an M113 guarding the bridge and uh, the if, if the Soviet player was good enough to survive they would uh, be attempting to protect so see Eisenbach there right and see the bridge that's by the woods uh, so the one hex of city uh, village, whatever you want to call it. So you put an M113 there, and that would basically, you know, stop the T72s from crossing the bridge because they probably they didn't have enough oomph left to to get across, right? Uh, unless you had already HE'd the crap out of the M113s and all sorts of stuff. So kind of unrealistic. But that kind of all worked in the the way way the rules worked, uh, and it also was possible for, with M one one threes to you know if you stretch the pools a little bit, you could go and do some close assaults with them against disrupted tanks. Naughty, naughty. All sorts of goofy things, and uh, the M one M one A ones were kind of like the, the the beastie guys, right? So they were cool. All right, so that that's my experience with with the system. What I'm going to do now is talk to you about the new, so that's context for you, right? I'm going to talk to you about the new new system. And I've got some pictures up here on my screen. I'm going to put the pictures up and we're going to talk about them. Hopefully they'll make sense as we go through things. And then I'll provide you some color commentary on, on the gameplay and what happened and, and stuff like that. So I went to Board Game Geek Con thing in Dallas. I was coming home from a trip uh, from somewhere, Kansas or somewhere. And uh, Dave Heath and Keith Trapton and Jeff Schulte were there and a couple other uh, lock and load employees. Not that Keith's an employee, but uh, there's a few folks there. And, uh, you know, Keith's the, 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 the kind of the owner of the reboot, right? And I'm really getting frustrated with this. Uh, let's see, I'll put this thing here like this and we can have a conversation. And we can stop looking at my face any second now. All right, so um, met those guys, snuck into the con. Shh, don't tell anybody, okay? I'm not paying 300 bucks to go or 200 bucks or however much it is to go visit, visit some friends for a few hours. 
so we, we set up in a side room and uh, they wanted to show me, you know, World of War. And I, you know, I had already sort of gone and had, you know, a couple of rounds of conversations with Keith about unit ratings and how the rules were going to work and why weren't there any M1A1s and we argued about 125 millimeter guns and 120 millimeter 105s and all this fun stuff and Keith is super geeky excited about this system and has done tons of research right gone through every game every module every title and really tried to understand and rationalize everything and then allocated the creatively named formations and given them historical historically accurate soviet names and u.s formation names so they have a real ob right and it's all kind of set some of this is all set around the full the gap and you'll be able to play larger larger scenarios with this system that will be representative of the full the gap terrain. And anyway, so so there's a lot of methodical research that went in to the game redesign, which has necessitated a lot of changes to counter values. And I kind of got hung up on some of the counter value changes because there was a clear weakening of things that in my mind, having played so much of World of War and played other games like MBT and other things like that, that I thought maybe we were kind of getting off, off track a little bit. But like anything, uh, you know, there's some devils in the details and stuff like that. So you can, uh, there's a now a, up on your screen, there should be, have be a um, unit card reference uh, picture. And it really just to give you a feel for a couple of things, I'm going to point a couple of things out on this this screen here. So up on the top right hand side, you can see a BRDM two, and it has recon vehicle. Well, that's no different than the, the normal recon units in World of War. They have an extended range for command. But where it starts to get interesting is the third counter down the T72. You'll see that there's an orange triangle and it says composite or reactive armor. And that orange triangle means that it's going to adjust the defensive dice for the unit that's, uh, if it, that T-72 is being shot at by ATGMs. And that's, so here's one of the first subtleties, right? So uh, rather than just looking at the counts and going, oh, well, you know, this, defensive rating is wrong it's not because when the saggers start to fly you're uh, you're you're and you've got composite armor or you know what they call you know reactive armor or era in mbt terms uh you're going to get a benefit from that uh for benefit against those missiles because of that armor and so there's a way to so that's a nice way of giving a, a little touch more realism. That's just one example, right? And if you know the old system, you'll know that you you know you would basically lead with your eight with your ATGM vehicles. They they were they were racing out there trying to take out uh, tanks at long range uh, because they were the deadliest unit on the board because they had the reach, right? Reach out and love someone. You were doing that with uh, uh, BMPs and BRDMs and well, not BRDMs, but you know BMP twos and stuff like that. It's knocking the crap out of everything, right? Uh, highly unrealistic type of thing. So there was a lot of thought. There's a, so my point here is there's a lot of thought that's gone into rationalizing how things work and, and why, what was good about each sort of vehicle type, right? So the M1s with the 105 millimeter gun. So they're, they're, if you look at them at just at the straight stats, and so let's look at that T72. Across the top, so there's a change in, in the layout across the top. You've got all the combat factors. The firepower for AP and the firepower for HE is now across the top. So you want to shoot something, you're looking at the numbers on the top of the band, the top of the counter. Range of 12, three dice, four or better to hit with AP. Range of six, uh, three dice, five or six to hit uh, with HE. On the bottom left-hand side, you've got three dice on the save 
uh, with uh, five or better to save. And if you know World of War, you know it's disrupt, step, and a limb, right? So that's just so we you know we know what we're talking about there when we look at that counter. Okay, now what what about so we look at that and go wow, twelve range of twelve, that's awesome. And if we pulled out, I can't. See See if I can see if I can find a, a photograph of an M1. I'm going to go now to the M1 counters. Uh, no, there we go. M1, eleven four five, right? So range of eleven, four dice, five or six to hit. And we were talking about here, it's three dice, four, five or six to hit because it's got a better a better uh, rating, a better gun. So uh, I, that was. That was tro troubling to me. I'm like, oh, well, uh, uh, no, uh, not the M1s. But um, because Team Yankee, right? Well, Team Yankee's got to win. Anyway, here's the cool thing. So we have the the the, the little orange triangle. So we're going to get some benefit from ATGM fire uh, when it's fired at us. And also on the move, we can move and fire. You can move your full uh, MPs and only lose one die. Uh, so it'd be... Three dice hitting on five or six, get into close range, right? Yeah, now you're gonna have a, a benefit there because you know if you know the old game, there was this: if you get to half range, you get to reduce the to hit number down to a, like a four, so it'll be a four, five, or six you're gonna hit on, and all that sort of fun stuff. So you and you do want to fire extended range, you can do that as well, and it's all factored in here. So that the M1s have this stabilization in their guns, they get to have this better. Uh, fire on the move type of capability they can move six hexes and shoot and you get the two extra activations anyway as a uh, as a u.s unit each formation gets two activations and the soviets only get one when the soviets move and fire they can also move uh more right they can move their full movement rate but they t they lose two die so that's really dropping them down now they've got one die and a like you know four or five or six to hit or something like that so my point about going on about this for the first 15 minutes is that there's lots of nuance going on here with the with the rules uh the the uh the helicopter landing takeoff nap of earth hovering when you can fire when you can't fire all that's been cleaned up uh you can see here there's lots of uh the HQ rules are being cleaned up. Let's talk about those, right? So this was really interesting. And one of the things that, you know, is, was a bugbear in the, in the, in the game system, the old game system, go hunt down the HQs, kill them. And it foobars the formation because now every unit has to roll for command check and survive a morale roll. So they do that, and then if they were disrupted, then they got a roll for a morale check for disruption, and you know that really made it hard for units to be active. And we all know that you know, once a is in the command unit got knocked out, or the command tank got knocked out, someone else is going to pick up the ball and run with it, or it would be hard to get rid of an entire command element, and you can't really target them all that effectively. We don't think, right? Because we don't really know because there wasn't a war, but we can surmise this um what ends up happening here is with the hq you place the hq unit down on a form on a unit in your formation every activation it can move around and so you choose where it's going to be and that's going to impact the range. you know who's in command uh based on range and it's going to impact the you know who gets the benefit of the hq as well so I thought that's kind of a neat way to do it. You can, the HQ will still have a chance to be reduced and still have a chance to be eliminated, but it's going to come back on its reduced side at some point in the future. The, one of the other problems with uh, it, it comes up uh, the next turn, it comes back the next turn. One of the problems with the HQ uh, counters in the old system was if you didn't have a unit was that, that was the same vehicle type or unit type, then the HQ couldn't come back on the board and hence you didn't have a way for it to be on the board and everyone was out of command. So this is a nice way to fix it. It's a generic unit. 
And if you've got the um, multi-unit formation, you know, you've got M1s and Bradleys and infantry and all sorts of different stuff in the formation, you don't want to be tied to the HQ being a Bradley if all the Bradleys are dead in the old system, they can't come back on. Here now, you just put it down somewhere and it's there. And that's fine. That kind of facilitates the, uh, or gives you the uh, imagination that the HQ unit is, you know, on the move and checking shit out and making things happen, right? So kind of cool like that. Um, solve that problem. Solve that niggle for for that now you can still hq hunt though because it is valuable if you knock out that hq on uh, and the americans first activation the second activation they're all going to be out of command unless they, they make a save on their morale uh, here's some people's fingers um moving and uh and uh doing some combat there so in this scenario of course the first moves, this one, it's a little bit different because we're, we're using T-64s instead of T-72s. And you can see the T-64s are pretty powerful too, right? Range of 12, three dice, four, five, or six to hit. Uh, but they need three sixes to save, right? But they do have that uh, reactive armor. So against ATGMs, they're going to get a bump on that. So nice, uh, some dice and stuff. Oh, the ammo rule. So this is interesting. The ammo rule... <coughs> was always a complication and we we <laughs> let's just say i didn't like the ammo rule for the earth the, the old the old way it was done uh this way just simplified uh you roll you roll dice against your morale to see if your ammo is your ammo out or ammo you're reloading and if you fail that you put a reloading marker on it and when you go to be activated again you roll again if you pass your morale check, you, you, you're, you're recovered. And if you don't, you're, re you're still reloading. Uh, so that that's a nice touch there, helps resolve some of those issues. So I'm just gonna now, I'm gonna let the rest of the pictures kind of play out. And I wanna just tell you a little bit more about my my gameplay and my feelings about the, the system and, and how, how things worked out for me, right? So as you can probably tell, the you know the artwork, I think, is excellent. The maps are replications of the original maps, with some enhancements and changes, uh, and some modifications to allow for some some uh, larger scale geomorphic things, and also mapping it to some more realistic terrain that was in this Fort the Gap area. And it gives you a, 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 a almost photorealistic sense, but in a gamey way, right? In a good gamey way. Uh, the counters are larger, the hexes are larger, so everything's the size of the Nations at War counters. And you know, keep in mind, this are prototype counters too. You're not going to be getting these laser cut deals. They are going to be die cut, but they're going to be this size and they're going to be relatively thick. So they're going to be the same size and quality is the nations at war counters which are pretty neat uh so uh, lots of good theme being built into it from an artwork perspective uh the counter art and the information counters are clear and concise i've got a few minor issues with the fire for effect counters being the same colors and color scheme as the rex counters and that makes them a little bit harder to find. That could be tweaked, but it doesn't really matter. The outer command markers are easy to find because you've got a little walkie-talkie with a red circle on the top right-hand side in that picture there. Hopefully that picture will still be there when I, I talk through this. Uh, and the, so so that, so production quality-wise, each box is gonna be three, three inch box. So nice, big and deep. You better put counter trays in there. Uh, lots of charts. You know, that's one of the things that you either love or hate with uh, Lock and Load. They're trying to make things easy for you. And so they're putting charts in that summarize the rules, summarize sequence of play, summarize, uh, there's a line of sight chart. So if you want to, you know, have see examples of line of sight and not go digging through the rule book, then you can do that. Uh, if you want to uh, look through all the different, uh, this, all the random events and things like that, there's a chart for that. There's each faction, Soviets, Germans, NATO, British, all the rest of it, they're all going to be having their own uh, formation charts and you're going to be able to see 
the point value. So if you want to create your own scenarios, you can do that. The point value of everything, the, the ratings of everything, what's in the formations. And these are historical formations for the Soviets and for NATO. So you've got to see that what's what's what the makeup is of, of all these different formations, which is kind of cool. So uh, lots of charts, right? Uh, the rule book has gone from 15 or 20 pages to uh, about 50 pages. Now, you might go, oh, wow, that's... I was like, what? You don't need 50 pages for this game. You just need to clean it up and uh, add three extra pages of errata and we're good. Well, all the changes they're making, uh, which on the whole, I didn't see anything that I didn't like. I liked a lot of what I saw. I enjoyed the gameplay and we're going to get to the gameplay because that's the point, right? We're going to get to that in a second. I cross my fingers and try not to forget that. Uh, the 56 pages or 50 pages of rules, 12 point font, lots of di expl explanatory diagrams, not a lot of wasted space with pictures of counter art and all that sort of stuff. It's it's detailed, concise, well-worded, well-explained, well-exampled rule set, full color, nice, really nice. Uh, I would say the first five or six pages are really all the kind of, here's the level set, fellas. Hey, here's all the things that are changing. Here's what the counters mean. Here's what all these information counters mean. Here's all the rest of it, right? So there's a, you know, five or 10 pages of that because there's a lot of stuff to kind of reset your expectations and your understanding of the game and how the game works. A really nice detailed sequence of play as opposed to the, the secrets of playing the whole system. So this is really and point by point, right? So it's all laid out. You know, if you're gonna put, you know, activate a formation, put your HQ down, do your artillery uh, uh, spotting now, do this now, do that now, now go move your guys and do your firing, all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, which we all know if you're a seasoned player, you know all that and it's all good and you don't really need to look at the sequence of play, I would say on the whole, you're gonna pick this game up, set it up and start playing straight away if you've played World of War. And what you will do is grab the rules reference chart, which is two sides. When you get to the point where, hey, am I at half range? Oh, okay, well, what, 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 what is anything different about that? I wanna do moving fire. Let me look at the moving fire summary. Hmm, okay, that's interesting. Maybe I should go check that out and read a little bit more detail on that. And then you can go to the rules reference and find it. Very fantastic index in the system, in the rule book, excuse me, and all the rest of it. So so I think as a, as a seasoned player, you're going to pick this up and go, awesome, and just jump right in. As a novice player, if you've never played a war game before, you're probably in for a little bit of work, but it's a fast, easy game to play. And I think I think you'll, you'll get it, right? And as a seasoned war gamer, if you want to play platoon scale, modern warfare, I don't, there's not another game out there that does this. Uh, at, at, that, that's this consumable. And there's a lot of, there's, there's some layers in here that I found out in my second game, right? My second game, uh, we started working out. I started appreciating some of the subtleties of the rule changes and how it would drive some tactical choices in the game. So I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, let's see. So I think, let me sum up now uh, and, and give you my impressions of the game from six hours of gameplay, two full scenarios played. And uh, the second scenario involved pretty much everything. Uh, we had chemical strikes, we had uh, mines, uh, artillery delivered mines. We had helos. We had Heinz. We had helo delivery. So, uh, you know, paratroop, uh, not paratroop, but, you know, like marine deliver delivery of uh, Soviet units to try and capture a town, battalion of tanks coming in, you know, a team Yankee equivalent size force and some Cobras and stuff like that. AA units, uh, the whole shooting match, right? So, uh, Lots of good stuff going on uh, in that scenario. Longer scenario, nine, nine turns. And uh, learnt the value of volley fire, which is now a feature for the, for the Soviets. It's not a, a, a random event. It actually uh, gives you a capability 
that is very powerful and will teach you to how to use Soviet doctrine and uh, cluster your units together appropriately in stacks of two and then do volley fire. Very, very deadly. So that's kind of cool. Um, so the gameplay, I felt like I was playing World of War. So all that thematic narrative generating, interesting, fun gameplay where you're reaching across the table, fist bumping your buddy, high-fiving when they miss and high-fiving when you hit and uh, getting excited and you're going, whoa, right? All, all of that's there, right? You know, it's funny. There was uh, We were playing that. There was four of us uh, sitting around the table together, David Heath and the developer and the designer and a couple other people and a few people dropped by to watch because we were having fun, right? Meanwhile, over in the corner, there's two dudes playing ASL. And they're, they're pulling their hair out, and you know, one of them's on a you know, respirator trying to stay alive while he's playing. And he wants to get through that last scenario. And two dudes in the corner pretending to play OCS, and, and I, I think they got a turn or two done, and they packed it all up. We got two full scenarios done, had a blast, a lot of fun, took a break for lunch. So that includes an a hour long lunch, and I had a business call I had to do. So in Five or six hours total. I think I got there at noonish, and I left at six or caught to six, six o'clock. Hour break for lunch. We cranked out a bunch of gameplay and had a blast. So I am pro. I was probably the most reticent uh, fan of the reboot. Right. I've actually, you know, privately said to my friends who are already on the system, you know, I'm not sure this is going to be something I want to drop money on to buy. And I'll probably, I'll take that back. I'll, I'll take it back after playing now. Uh, it's really good. It, it really is good. And um, I, I think there's a, there's, you know, we picked up a few niggles, right? A few things that need to be fixed. Uh, wrong mark on these uh, pre-production counters. There were some uh, items that had the, wrong capabilities on the wrong side of the counter so they've got reversed so i think a bit a thorough check of everything needs to be done before the it goes to final print production uh with minor rules clarifications as we were going through things uh, i didn't look at the rules i didn't need to i just had the rule summary the sequence of play we went after it obviously had the designer there so lots of explanations there Although Keith is really funny because he's so geeked out about all the all the technology and all the the history behind it and what was actually going on and how AT, ATGM missiles were delivered for reload by the truckload and all that sort of stuff. Excuse me for the out of focus stuff and and how that all worked. That he was forgetting his own rules and Jeff was going, "No, dude, that's not the rule. This is the rule, right?" That were uh, arguing with each other it was pretty funny. So we had a great time and I really want to thank uh, David for hosting me there uh, and. Uh, setting the game up and letting me play with it and ask dumb questions and, and all the rest of it. It was really a lot of fun. Um, you're going to see me back online in just a few minutes. I'm going to do a couple of sh uh, shrink rippy things on some items that I purchased uh, from Lock and Load just recently. And we'll talk about those in a minute. But uh, I wanted to uh, give you my, um, my hearty endorsement of this new system. And for all of you that are sitting on the fence, I will go so far as to say that uh, you should get off that fence and you should uh, consider making a purchase of this. Uh, it, it is going to be different. It is going to be m more layered in and nuanced in gameplay and tactics. It's going to be just as much fun. You're still going to feel like you're playing World of War. You've got a lot of great scenarios in here and lots of new scenarios too. I don't uh, I, I don't recall the second scenario's name that we played and I don't know that it's one of the original scenarios. It may well be, but I don't recall ever playing this scenario. Lots and lots of fun. So, uh, and of course, if you've never played World at War, you know, you, you, you need to just go get on this action because it's good fun. If you want to play platoon scale World War Three, this is your system. For, for anyone who's never played World of War or, or who is curious about World War Three, fun, fast playing, entertaining, and historically interesting and mostly accurate kind of gameplay without the grind, right? 
this is what you need. All right, that's that's my little spiel, my little spin, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to all of you soon. And I hope you enjoyed the pictures that uh, from the two scenarios. You should be able to tell which is which, but I'll, I'll put some sort of AAR up at some point. Ciao.